So um, let's talk about what you enjoy most uh, about your work. I'm going to have to say it's the beauty that is inherent in science and the art that lives within basic research. And quite frankly, I can think of no better example of that than, you know, for me as a biochemistry and uh, molecular biology PhD, the joy I'm getting from knowing that, that those endeavors are bringing us out of this pandemic at the very moment that we're speaking right now. So mRNA vaccines, while they were well studied in mice and, and lower primates, this is the first time they've been used in humans. And what that creativity is bringing to the human race at this moment is enthralling. It's, it's, it's amazing to me as, yeah. a, as a basic scientist. Okay. So with your work, what are some of your goals? What do you hope to achieve? One thing that I want to achieve is to leave a legacy at KCU in Joplin, an interface between basic science and clinical science research endeavors, a platform that I can leave behind. And I hope that culture continues after I leave to engage young healthcare professionals in the endeavors of basic research and, and motivate them uh, to know the inherent beauty of all of that and importance of the interface between basic science and clinical science. That culture is what I hope to achieve at, at this university. Great. And do you recall, or can you pinpoint a, a time when and why you became interested in science and oh, yeah. research? That's easy for me. So my father, PhD in botany, I believe, in Ames, Iowa, and he became chair of Nebraska Wesleyan University when I was six. Uh, so we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, where he started a pre-med program. And in his day, he's retired now. It became the premier pre-med program in Nebraska if you wanted to get into medical school. Interface with young uh, healthcare professionals, you know, folks who wanted to become doctors. Um, so at the dinner table, I would learn about mitochondria being bacteria at one point that moved in to make eukaryotes and evolution uh, and always had the expectation of becoming uh, a scientist. So that formative time in growing up really gave me a, a huge appreciation for uh, what science could do for a person, having watched my father build this program and, and many, many people come through it. So that was interesting. He, he taught me how to run an autoclave at age 10. We'd make blood auger plates back in the day. I'm talking, you know, early 70s <laughs> with his blood. <laughs> so this is how you run an autoclave. And then I would withdraw the blood from his arm and put it in the auger and then cool it and pour it and play with beta hemolytic streptococcus, which is a pretty serious pathogen in his lab, you know, when I'm 12. <laughs> so that was pretty fun. Opportunity to kind of be uh, just thrown in, right? Yeah. To, to this environment where you can <laughs> kind of learn a whole wide range of things. It was great. The facilities uh, that he threw me into um, were really pretty good at Nebraska Wesleyan University. And so we'd go in on every weekend and just, for me, it was playtime. And, you know, I learned so much just uh, hanging out in his laboratory and watching him uh, do his science That's and really why, cool. why to do his science. That's really what I learned. Yeah. Not, not just how, but why, mm -hmm. which is really important. And it's, it's to bring the passion to young healthcare professionals. It's always been that for me. Describe your journey, um, you know, your growing up and education and career um, and family, if you'd like uh, to share some of that. So I, I described some of that. So I'll just start with my education. Uh, Nebraska Wesleyan, Bachelor of Science in Biology. And, and then at that point, I wanted to, you know, cut the cord a little bit. So I moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I was a research technician in Moose Tower at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Pharmacology. At that time, so it was 87, 88, uh, there was a big race to clone the opiate receptor. And I found myself in a, a huge laboratory that was extremely well-funded in a heated race to clone um, opiate receptors. 
with all the implications thereof. I mean, that was a pretty important discovery that was at that time, you know, there was a big race to do it. So I got in this lab and learned um, a couple of techniques, did some experiments and presented my results and they were not in congruence <laughs> with cloning the opiate receptor. And I said so out loud, being a naive young, budding young scientist, my uh, scientific conclusions were not met with enthusiasm. And so I lost my job <laughs> wow. and then moved to um, a different lab in which it was the Canada Albicans Genome Project. So we were doing physical mapping. Throughout these experiences, I learned a couple of things. A, some super cool techniques in both pharmacology and genetic mapping, but B, not to fall in love with your hypothesis because turns out the data I presented was real and they were kind of on the garden path a little bit. And that experience taught me how to learn uh, from being down and how to pull yourself back up. Grit, resilience, all those key ingredients uh, to being a scientist. Absolutely. So time <laughs> healed, heals all wounds. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> okay, so from there, graduate school in the University of Texas, Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences in Houston, Texas at MD Anderson Cancer Hospital. Mm -hmm. I worked for this amazing mentor, Dr. Eric Olson, who was unveiling how a single cell becomes muscle. Being in that laboratory, it grew from six people to 36 people throughout my PhD. And we moved to UT Southwestern in Dallas in those five years, about the middle of my PhD. So again, having to break down the lab, move the lab, rebuild the lab taught me perseverance and, and grit and how to get through not adversity, but change. Mm -hmm. That was a formative experience. From there, I went to GlaxoSmithKline, uh, Breakthrough Medicines for Everyday Living. That's uh, one of the larger pharmaceutical companies in the world. And Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Okay, cool. Where I joined the um, Molecular Endocrinology Group. It was a group of about 90 folks uh, in a well-equipped and, and well-funded. Great uh, part of the country, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it's beautiful. Okay, so that taught me uh, the finer points of academia, which my whole career up to that point had been versus corporate science. And that was a very valuable experience too. So I elected to go back to academia so I could have the illusion of being in control of my own destiny. <laughs> <laughs> I like that rather than being told what to do by a lawyer or a businessman in the corporate world. Sure. But the power that they can bring to a given pro healthcare problem is self-evident, right? They built those vaccines in eight or nine months. And that's what the corporate world can do that um, the academic world cannot. Corporate world can move at the speed of light, whereas academia goes a little bit slower. Yeah, tell me when you came to KCU and, and, and what that's been like. So after GlaxoSmithKline, I went to a short postdoc at the at KU Med in Kirk Claussen's lab. He was the chair of pharmacology and toxicology. Because of some of the discoveries I'll, I'll describe later in this interview uh, led me to his lab. He was a world's expert, almost one of the more highly cited uh, scientists in the world. So it was a, a, a really formative time, but I was craving my own independence pretty heavily. <laughs> After yeah. your, your second postdoc, you start to get a little antsy. So then a position opened up in um, Lawrence, Kansas at the School of Pharmacy. So I joined the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology there as faculty. And that was in uh, 2001. So I immediately began teaching toxicology to pharmacy students as well as um, biochemistry and molecular biology to graduate students. So I had a PhD program, a master's program, and a PharmD program to, to nurture in that environment. And I did so for 16 years, fully funded from the NIH uh, for all of those years. Um, 
through that experience, I learned a lot about myself. First and foremost, um, I'm interested in educating healthcare professionals as much as I am in the laboratory. And most of my training in my early career was how to do it in the lab. Being a professor for 16 to 17 years taught me how to do it in the classroom. And I found that I was very passionate about that as well. Then for economic reasons, for family reasons, for myriad reasons, I was always looking for the private university on the horizon, scanning the horizon during my time at KU and KCU came across, believe it or not, on LinkedIn. <laughs> and that spoke to me, a private university that is osteopathic, opening a brand new campus in Joplin uh, and uh, learning about osteopathy, it, it made sense to me that they could use a scientist of, of my training and ilk to open research opportunities in this brand new medical school in the southwest corner of Missouri. And also having grown up on a farm, I guess I'm a bit of a hayseed. <laughs> And I, like, I like this part of the country. I yeah. like this part of the country. And that spoke to me as well, as well as my family needed a change. And, and it's been so good for my wife and son in Joplin. We, we've enjoyed our time here immensely. We're having myriad adventures and we really love it here. It's great. Um, name three things that most people don't know about you. I'm a musician, I'm a farmer, and a devoted father and, and husband. Uh, we love camping. We're going to the Grand Tetons in a couple of weeks. Oh, excellent. Um, it's enthralling that spring is here and, and, and- Oh my gosh, yeah. 50 feet from my back door in this laboratory where I am right now, they're giving COVID shots and it's, it's packed. It's so exciting. It's so exciting right here, right now. My son, who's 12, is becoming an amazing pianist all of a sudden. Oh, wow. He gets up in the morning, the first thing he does is go to the piano and play me a song. And he's amazing. <laughs> that is awesome. And he's really starting to catch fire and it's such a joy to see. That's amazing. I yeah, giving your family the gift of music is a lifelong thing. Just like giving young healthcare professionals the gift of science, of research, is a lifelong gift as well. Mm -hmm. So you've told me a little bit about, you know, some of the things you like to do. As, um, is there anything else that you like to do for fun with your family? Yeah, we garden. And right now we have a house in one acre as opposed to a house in 50 acres we had four years ago. So we're raising baby chicks right now. And oh. So <laughs> they're cute, just as cute as you think. <laughs> Um, and garden we grow a big garden every year and we can it's a, mostly a salsa garden but we do broccoli and cauliflower and strawberries and make jam we like to can a lot that's a lot of fun awesome okay pregnant next receptor and drug disposition in liver and intestine so another way to to think about this I'm going to tell you a story about nuclear receptor signaling, and then I'm going to get into drug metabolism pathways in liver and intestine. This is really uh, 25 to 30 years of my life uh, encapsulated in these following 10 to 15 slides. So by way of introduction, nuclear receptors are these depicted in the small red circle here that kind of looks like Pac-Man. They're ligand activated transcription factors. And what that means is they bind to DNA and regulate the expression of genes. And from a very young age, I was always interested in how are genes turned on and off. So this was a natural fit for me. It turns out small lipophilic greasy ligands bind to this receptor, change its conformation to bind to DNA and then regulate gene expression. Some of the more familiar ligands you'll see here. You folks will recognize estradiol or estrogen. This is a cholesterol-like backbone that is the hormone secreted in your body that binds to the receptor, which is a transcription factor that's expressed in the case of estrogen receptors 
in breast and uterus, and they then bind as a complex to DNA in those tissues to regulate target gene expression. So what we're talking about is turning genes on and off in response to hormones and how that works. Mm -hmm. And it turns out humans have 48 of these super family members. This is a huge family of transcription factors, most of which are activated by small lipophilic greasy hormones or ligands. And they have a conserved overall structure that defines the family. There's a DNA binding domain, there's a ligand binding domain. And in the history of endocrinology, I'm gonna now give you a little lecture on the history of endocrinology. And that is, they isolated the hormones first and they had no idea how they worked, but they knew they were uber powerful. Then they identified the receptors for all of the hormones that were known at that time. Then the field paused and thought, aha, we're done. But lo and behold, along came molecular biology and using tools of molecular biology, we found there's a bunch of so-called orphan receptors. And these are receptors that had no known ligand associated with them. So what are these guys doing? That's interesting biology. And then the so-called adopted orphans. When I got into the field, the task was, okay, we got 48 of these super family transcription ligand activated factors in our body. What do they do? That's an interesting biological question. It's a very basic question, but it's a very important question because it turns out about $10 billion of drugs per year go through one of the other of these family members to include anti-diabetic drugs, uh, hypercholesterolemia drugs, um, birth control, um, all, kind, all kinds of pharma, pharmacotherapy that's very important to the pharmaceutical industry. The name of the game at that time was to identify the receptors. And I identified this one, PXR, that binds to and is activated by foreign compounds. Literally, pharmaceutical agents bind and activate this receptor. It turns out many compounds, including the antibiotic rifampicin, which is used in meningitis or uh, some yeast infections, phenobarbital, a sedative, or herbal remedies such as St. John's wort uh, can activate PXR, which then goes on to regulate all phases of drug metabolism, phase one, phase two, and phase three drug metabolism genes. So this is incredibly important in the drug discovery process. It turns out the FDA requires that any drug that you bring to market, you have to know whether it activates this pathway or not. And what happened was there's a species specific effect. In drug discovery, the first animal, live animal species they go into is usually mouse or rat. And then as they go up the chain and eventually they get into humans, uh, these pathways are regulated in different ways. It turns out compounds that activate this pathway in mice and rats don't activate this pathway in humans, even though they're the same, and it's all due to the evolution of PXR in those species. So what I did in my career is I knocked it out of the mouse, the mouse PXR, and replaced it with the human PXR. And with those biochemical tools, drug companies can now determine the extent to which this pathway is perturbed at stage one, way before they get to clinical trials. And that saves them billions of dollars because if it activates this pathway, it's not the kiss of death for that drug, but it won't be the best in class because this is a very important pathway. If it does um, perturb this pathway that we unveiled, um, your drug candidate is not the best in class. And, and so that's an interesting and useful discovery. So that's been my science up to this point. And I think it takes around, typically in the dr drug discovery world, it takes around 10 years and a billion dollars to take a molecule from discovery to the market. A lot of the cost in that process uh, is involved with clinical trials. If you can determine early on that your drug candidate perturbs this pathway that's so pivotal to drug-drug interactions in patients, um, you'll save a lot of time, money, and effort having that knowledge very early in the drug discovery process rather than in phase one, phase two clinical trials. So 
the importance of basic science in unveiling these types of basic molecular pathways that operate in our bodies contributes enormously to um, the well-being of your patient down the road.